strap yourselves in because this week's case is all over the place and likely to leave you feeling angry by the time it's done. This week, we're heading all the way back to 1914, and a case that would come to be known as the family sentenced to death. It all began on the morning of December 30th, 1914, when the father of a farming family was found dead in the barn by his 14-year-old adopted daughter. The man had apparently been beaten to death and was covered in blood. Because nobody saw any footprints in the snow outside the barn, and because blood-stained clothes were found hidden on the roof, police deduced that a family member must have killed the 50-year-old, and then arrested the remaining members of the family. The man's mother-in-law and adoptive mother, 68, his wife, 45, and his two sons, 23 and 19. A preliminary hearing was held the following day, and the man's youngest son confessed to killing his father. According to the boy, all four family members discussed the plan to kill him the night before, December 29th, and it was actually his grandmother who came up with the idea. His father was, apparently, a lazy drunk, dragging the family down with more and more debt. The other family members agreed because the man also had a life insurance policy, so at the very least, they would see a payout and could hopefully use that to move on with their lives. According to the 19-year-old, he waited with his older brother for their father to head to the barn at 5.30am on the 30th to pound his daily rice. The younger brother smashed him with a pestle while the older brother strangled and killed him. Seemed to be a cut and dry case, but the other three family members denied that any of this ever happened. And then, the boy retracted his confession. He claimed he only confessed because he could hear his mother and grandmother being tortured, and he was unable to stand it any longer. Did the boy actually kill his father, but retract his statement when his family cut him loose, or did he give a fake confession simply to save his mother and grandmother? It was far from the end of this bizarre case. In fact, it was only the beginning. The second preliminary hearing was held just over two weeks later, on January 15th, 1915. This time around, it was the eldest son who confessed to killing his father, and the boy claimed the other family members had nothing to do with it. The young man claimed that he wanted money to buy some women, so he planned to steal rice from the house to sell. However, when he snuck into the barn, his father suddenly appeared, and so he beat him to death with a pestle. And yet again, the 23-year-old then retracted his confession, just like his younger brother, and claimed he only confessed because he was worried about his family, and particularly how his elderly grandmother wouldn't survive jail. Once again, a family member confessed to the crime because they were worried about their other family members, but then shortly retracted their statement. Both confessions claimed that a pestle had been used to kill the 50-year-old father, but both boys also admitted that they only did so because they feared for their other family members being jailed or tortured. What was really going on? Once the first trial began, the preliminary judge took all of the pre-trial hearings into account, including the two confessions that were then soon retracted. When weighing up the evidence available to him, the judge believed the youngest son's confession to be true, and also indicted the mother, grandmother and eldest son on charges of murder. Regardless of the fact that the 19-year-old retracted his confession and claimed he only made it because he could hear his family being tortured, the judge believed that the crime was committed to obtain the father's life insurance payout and the other family members were accessories to murder. On June 2nd, Roughly half a year later, the judge accepted the youngest son's confession and sentenced all four family members to death for their part in the murder, again believing this to be a case of the family trying to get the man's life insurance money. The defence quickly argued that the trial wasn't fair, however, and their request for witnesses had been refused, while the judge hurried the trial along to a quick decision. Naturally, the defence appealed, but surprisingly, they weren't alone. The prosecution also appealed, believing that a death sentence for a 68-year-old grandmother was too much. 
despite the fact that the court viewed her as the mastermind behind the murder. At the appeal, the defence brought out several pieces of information that helped muddy the case even further. First, they tore into the youngest son's confession. They claimed the family actually got along well. There was no friction between the man and his wife and children, and despite claims that he was lazy and in debt, he was actually a hard worker and financially secure. The man's life insurance was also a paltry 300 yen payout, hardly enough for anyone to want to commit murder over. Second, there was a certain part of the boy's confession that made it impossible. He claimed that the family discussed the murder on the night of December 29th, but they stopped when the father returned home at 9pm. This was impossible, however, because both sons were at a youth meeting that didn't end until 8.30pm. Therefore, neither of them could have been there at the time this supposed discussion took place. Third, the autopsy revealed that the father had been stabbed to death with a knife or a knife-like object. Both boys claimed in their retracted confessions to have killed him with a pestle, and in the case of the younger brother that he was also strangled to death. The man was also struck with a blunt object, but examination determined it to be something roughly 5 centimetres long and 2 centimetres wide, and therefore it couldn't have been a pestle. It was most likely a club, hoe, or the handle of a nutter. Fourth, the fact that no footprints were found leaving the area meant very little. The defence pointed to testimony from investigators on the scene that there was little snow there to begin with when they arrived, and there was also the possibility that earlier snowfall had simply buried the footprints anyway. On the prosecution's side, they decided they actually wanted an acquittal for the mother, grandmother, and youngest son, switching to the eldest son as the culprit instead. They announced that the results of the autopsy more closely sided with the eldest son's version of events. They claimed that at the third preliminary hearing, the eldest son said he hit his father on the forehead, back of the head, back, and chest. The father had a fracture in his ribs that was invisible to the naked eye and only discovered at the autopsy, meaning only the killer could know that he had been hit there and the investigators didn't discover this until later. Naturally, this was a flimsy argument to begin with because there are only so many places to hit a body and claiming to hit someone in the head, back and chest doesn't seem like the son had any secret knowledge. But either way, that was what the prosecution was going for. The appeal ended on April 11th, 1916, almost a year and a half after the father's murder. And on the 27th of the same month, the judge agreed with the prosecution and upheld the death sentence for the eldest son, whilst releasing the other family members. The family soon moved away from their village after the trial and were never seen or heard of again no doubt not wanting to live with constant talk of them being potential murderers, and in the case of the eldest son, literally being sentenced to death for the murder of his father. The defence still refused to accept that either son killed the father, and wrote a special petition to the courts asking to clear the young man's name. Again they cited how it would have been impossible for the young man to kill his father, and laid the evidence out. In the eldest son's confession, he claimed that he came up with the idea to kill his father on December 28, while visiting a brothel with his friend. It was then he got the idea to steal some rice to sell for money, to pay for more women. Yet this was impossible, because the young man, who was self-taught and well-educated, was teaching in a night school when this supposedly took place. Investigators never bothered to interview the brothel owner, nor the young man's friend, to confirm that this exchange ever took place. No human blood was found on the eldest son's clothing that he wore at the time of the crime either. In fact, none of the clothing confiscated by police from all the family members had any blood on it whatsoever. The defence also pointed out that the young man's confession claimed his father carried six large bales of hay around the farm that day, despite there being heavy snowfall all day. 
Yet despite all the evidence to the contrary, it was all for naught, and the eldest son was executed on December 8, 1917, three years after his father's murder. In a note written 18 minutes before his death, the young man wrote, I am to be executed on a false charge, but I believe that God will know my heart is clear. I have nothing left to say, and my spiritless corpse may be buried according to any religion whatsoever. By God's grace, I am on my way to heaven, and I pray you do not grieve for me. It was discovered after the young man's death that the father's autopsy report had been given to the judge the day before the eldest son's confession, meaning the prosecution actually did know the father had been hid in the chest a full day before the son confessed, despite claiming they didn't know. Whether this particular piece of vital evidence played a large part in declaring the young man guilty or not, it's impossible to say. But either way, it seems incredibly unlikely that any of the family members had anything to do with the father's death, and shoddy police work let the real killer get away. And in the end, it resulted in a diligent, studious young man losing his life and forever officially being known as a father killer. But what do you guys think about this one? Let me know in the comments below and I'll see you again next time.